Hi, I'm Dr. Nick Begich, and we're here today with the first in a series of videos. Today's video is focused on the mind, human performance, and enhancing human performance. Throughout the day, we're going to demonstrate a number of tools and a number of technologies that are here now in the 21st century. We're going to talk about the good use of technology versus uh, uses that are detrimental to human affairs. Enjoy the video today and enjoy the presentation. Uh, it's going to be a good one. We're going to be filled with information. And today we're in the backdrop of my home in Alaska. Thanks for being with me today. Today we're going to be talking about mind control in the 21st century. Uh, but first, let's give a little bit of background on who I am. I'm Dr. Nick Begich. I was born and raised in Alaska. I have a doctorate in traditional and complementary medicines and a background in, in politics here in this part of the world. I've been active on these issues and issues on technology throughout the world. I've lectured in 22 countries all over the United States. I've worked with 200 radio and TV producers around the world um, to get these issues into the um, hearts and minds of folks so that we can really debate and look at what the potential is both on uh, the positive side of technology as well as some of the things that we all need to be concerned about and, and look out for. Here in Alaska, I also work as a tribal administrator uh, for Chickaloon Village, one of the federally recognized Native American tribes in Alaska. I worked as an administrator in public education. Uh, in the last 10 years, have been actively engaged uh, primarily in activist work surrounding these issues. Most recently, I was appointed executive director of the Lay Foundation on Technologies based in Dallas, Texas, to take technology issues forward, to educate the public, so that we can all be more informed as we move forward into this century. First, let me give a little bit of background on uh, this whole area. You know, the military's interest in this area goes back to the Korean conflict. Right after the Korean War, returning veterans, uh, prisoners of war, uh, had really unusual behavioral changes. In fact, as, as our military began to look um, at these guys and find out what was going on with them, we found out that huge uh, psychological transformations were made. Uh, these were made um, through lots of different methods, mainly affecting the emotions of folks. Uh, what happened as a result of this is our military and others became very interested in the idea of manipulating uh, human behavior for lots of different purposes. I mean, obviously, uh, in, in prisoners of war situations, the idea of interrogating folks where they're more uh, liable and susceptible to giving the information up uh, was the main em emphasis during the Korean conflict and, of course, was an, a, of interest to our uh, military as well. From the 1950s, things changed pretty dramatically. As we rolled into the 1960s, a lot of interest into the idea of electronically controlling uh, what happens within the human brain was being pursued. In fact, in the early part of the Vietnam War, back in uh, the mid-60s, a device called the LIDA machine, L-I-D-A, was captured from the uh, Russians. It was used in interrogating U.S. prisoners in Vietnam. And essentially what it was was an oscillating strobe light mixed with um, uh, auditory signals that actually caused what's called brain entrainment, the idea of the brain beginning to mirror or follow those external signals. And what this did is put people in a highly suggestive state and a state where they were more willing to give up intelligence. This particular device triggered a whole cascade of interest, primarily from Central Intelligence Agency. In fact, it was right after um, uh, this period of time in the early 70s that this whole adventure became the inter of interest to our U.S. Congress. Back in uh, 1975, the United States Congress uh, did a full analysis of what the Central Intelligence Agency was doing in the United States. And within that analysis, uh, they published this report. And this is a report on, uh, on the activities within the United States. And if people remember, the Central Intelligence Agency was supposed to be dealing with things only off of our shores, not within our boundaries. Now, in the 60s, the CIA was used for infiltrating student groups, getting involved in surveillance of everyone from the Congress all the way through activist organizations, individuals through the United States. During this same period of time, a huge controversy broke, and it was the MK Ultra, Ultra controversy. And this dealt with the idea of taking individuals utilizing primarily chemical means, LSD and other um, mind-altering uh, drugs to see if you could alter behavior in a favorable way for military uh, adventures. In fact, the abuses that were um, uh, engaged at that time are actually spoken about in this congressional report. The sad story is 
that of all of the victims, thousands of military personnel used in these experiments as well as others, never once uh, was, a, was a government fully held accountable until one individual um, actually committed suicide. Uh, that resulted in a lawsuit that eventually was settled by the Central Intelligence Agency in favor of that individual who was subjected to this kind of experimentation. At Laurentian University in Canada, similar work was being done really developing methods, protocols for influencing human behavior without chemical means. If you even go back um, to the 60s again for, for a few minutes, and let's talk about another guy. This guy was Jose Delgado. Jose Delgado put together this book. Uh, this is Physical Control of the Mind Toward a Psycho-Civilized Society. Jose had his degree in electrophysiology from the University of Madrid. He was granted his degree in 1950, and once um, achieving that, 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 that degree, he spent his time sort of mapping the brain, looking at what parts of the brain affect various parts of, of our behavior uh, and activity. What he found uh, was that the brain could be mapped, that you could actually implant um, electrodes within the brain and get a number of effects. And some of that he was doing with, with primates, he was doing it with, uh, with bulls um, as well. In fact, this image is, is Jose Delgado with a charging bull coming at him. He threw a radio uh, transmitter, threw the switch on it, and basically stopped the bull, uh, not dead, but stopped it dead in its tracks, uh, where it stopped the charge. This was done in 1969. Now, back in 1969, uh, Jose Delgado had left Spain, had come to the United States, was working primarily at Yale University uh, in this work, where he continued his work until the mid-'80s. What he found is that he was able to stimulate the brain utilizing an implanted technology and cause a number of effects in primates, uh, bulls, and even human beings. By the 1980s, he found that he didn't need uh, any physical contact uh, with the human brain. He just needed to oscillate or vibrate um, uh, energy into the brain in a very specific way. And what he found in 1985 was that you could create tremendous changes in human brain chemistry by oscillating energy in at one-fiftieth of what the Earth naturally produces in the radio frequency range. Now, if you think about that in a broader sense, how much radio frequency energy is around us right now at this moment is about 200 million times more than nature produces on its own. So take what nature produces on its own, cut it down to one-fiftieth of that amount of energy, and that was what was sufficient to override uh, human brains and, and primates in such a way as to change them from, say, lethargic and passive to highly aggressive and agitated, almost like throwing on and off a light switch. This was documented in, in work at Yale University. Um, this work has also been documented in our books, uh, which is part of the basis of this series, The Earth Rising, uh, Earth Rising, the Revolution and Earth Rising, uh, t t the Betrayal of Science, Society, and the Soul. And in these two books, we actually lay out over a thousand reference sources, laying out exactly where each, each bit of information comes from, primarily quoting mainstream media reports, academic studies, uh, unclassified military records, and, and work done in a number of institutions around the world. On this subject, we were also Pretty, pretty impressed by the idea that finally one of the leading um, uh, publications in the world, The Economist, actually took this issue on uh, in this cover story from the end of May uh, 2002. And in this cover story, the beginning of the dialogue, the debate on the ethics of mind control, the ethics of artificially manipulating uh, the human brain uh, for, for military applications. If you take it a little bit further and we start to look at sort of what did the military do during the 60s that was the most impressive. The thing that, that struck me is, was not the chemical test, because those are pretty obvious to everyone. It was the idea more in line with what Delgado and others were, were utilizing, which was this idea of oscillating um, electromagnetic fields of various kinds. The radio frequency energy was being uh, as being one of those uh, primary movers. As we looked into the history of the technology, what we were able to find is over three dozen U.S. patents tra tracing the evolution from the early, um, the early 1960s primarily up until uh, the beginning of this century. And many of those you'll find available on the DVD um, as reference material that goes with this presentation because we want people to have those hard documents and access to that information directly. 
The other thing that I would say in terms of military applications uh, it became pretty interesting as we started to see the evolution of the technology and we started to see writers like Zbigniew Brzezinski when he was at Columbia University take this issue on. If you go back to a book, this book, Between Two Ages, this was written by Brzezinski before he became National Security Advisor to Jimmy Carter when he was President of the United States. And within the context of this book, startling things uh, start to emerge in, in, in terms of the technology and where it's going. One in particular that was, was, was a, an interesting idea, the one, one fielded by a researcher named Gordon J.F. MacDonald. And I'll just read this short quote. He was a geophysicist specializing in problems of warfare, and this is what he, what he thought was possible. J.F. Gordon MacDonald, a geophysicist specializing in problems of war, has written that accurately timed, artificially excited electronic strokes could lead to a pattern of oscillations that produce relatively high power levels over, over certain regions of the Earth. In this way, one could develop a system that would seriously impair brain performance of very large populations in selected regions over, over an extended period, no matter how deeply disturbing the thought of using the environment to manipulate behavior for national advantages, to some the technology permitting such use will very probably develop within the next few decades. This was written in 1973, and in those last few decades that is exactly the technology that has emerged and the technology we'll be discussing today. Some of the other areas that, that became pretty interesting, and it wasn't just to us, but others were looking at this whole idea of, of weapons advancements and technology as it could affect human behavior on a, on a large scale covering the entire planet and then something much more narrower. The things that Brzezinski was talking about was this idea of being able to um, oscillate energy in such a way that you could create a signal that would return to the Earth in such a way as to alter behavior. How does that work? Let's talk a little bit about the mechanisms behind uh, brain entrainment and what exactly that means. Affecting human behavior, affecting the brain, can be done in a number of different ways. Uh, firstly, um, uh, you, you need to look at sort of what are the uh, predominant brain wave act activity within the brain and how does that uh, line up against what we generally know. Uh, let's, let's break it down into four areas. We're going to talk about um, alpha waves, beta waves, uh, uh, theta waves uh, and delta waves. And, and we're going to start with the deepest, deepest um, states of human consciousness. When you're totally knocked out, deep sleep, you're in this deep delta state, which is approximately one to four hertz or vibrations per second or pulses per second. Um, if, you looked at an, uh, if you looked at an EEG to look at that brain activity, you'd see this sort of pulsing uh, energy within this range of one to four hertz. The next level up is called theta. Theta runs between approximately 4 and 7 hertz, or pulses per second or vibrations per second. Uh, this is the place that most um, people are when you're sort of in between awake and asleep, where you're consciously dreaming but you're still um, unconscious, but you have that sort of in-between state. That's the theta state. This is where most um, three to five year olds spend most of their time. If you were to look at an EEG of their brains, this is where the predominant activity is, which gives um, gives a clear explanation of why sometimes it's difficult for young children to separate the imaginary world from the real world. It's because of where they generally live. But in this, in this same place of where their brains are, where they absorb tremendous amounts of information, you think of three to five year olds in terms of language skills, social behavior, the kinds of things they're learning, the other thing that happens is we shove kids into an early frame of learning where the brains aren't fully developed for the kind of academic studies uh, that many of us uh, push our kids into maybe a little bit too prematurely. As an example, in Europe, they don't even start children in school till usually seven years old versus the five and four-year-olds being started uh, in school in the United States and in preschool programs. Now, the next stage is the alpha stage. This runs approximately seven to 12 hertz. This is where you are uh, when you're in the zone, when you're focused, when you're um, as an artist or an athlete, where you're just at your optimum performance. For accelerated learning, for certain uh, particular uh, types of learning, this is extremely um, useful uh, brain range to be in. It's where you want to be uh, for intellectual work and creative work. The next level is beta. This is where you're actively engaged, um, thinking and learning. At the same time, um, there's a little bit more emotional content 
uh, in terms of the dialogue. As you get to high beta, you get it to those agitated states or states where, um, where we're not in as good a control of ourselves as we like to be. So the range, if you're looking at uh, children that, that function, say, at too high a beta, um, these are folks that are um, attention deficit disordered often cataloged uh, in that way. Also, if they're running theta, they're running too low of a frequency range. Oftentimes, we categorize children um, as uh, learning disabled. And yet, really what may be happening in many instances when we diagnose too early is the brain just hasn't fully developed to where the alpha rhythms and the better rhythms tend to dominate uh, the waking state, which is, is where we want to be as adults. The interesting thing in terms of study is what was discovered early on, uh, originally by Delgado and others, was the idea that external fields, when they were coherent or rhythmic and followed very specific patterns, could override the activity of the normal brain. And this could be done uh, with uh, pulsating radio frequency signals, pulsating electromagnetic fields, uh, with um, oscillating light or pulsating light, um, and it could also be done with sound. Now, if you think about sound, sound waves and, and, and sound itself, for the human ear to perceive it, we don't perceive the very, very low frequency sounds. Um, Animals like elephants can perceive those low frequency sounds. Um, other animals uh, that have large receivers, ears that pick up those low frequency sounds can, can do that, but we can't. So what happens is the brain, not being able to hear below a certain range, cannot pick up these low rhythms that can cause brain entrainment unless you can create sort of a cancellation effect. And here's what's been developed. A gentleman named Robert Monroe back in the uh, late 1950s, early 1960s, discovered that if you sent sound into one ear at, say, 16,000 cycles per second or vibrations per second within the range of human hearing, and one in at, say, 16,007 in the other ear, so you have 16,000 coming in here, 16,007 coming in here, and they cancel within the brain and leave a beat frequency of 7 hertz within the alpha range, as an example, the brain locks onto that beat frequency, and this is called bioral beat. Um, it was actually patented by Monroe. Um, it was used to develop a number of technologies, but the real effect of bioral beat is pretty profound. If you look at this image, and this is an image taken from uh, the Monroe Institute, you can see a normal brain on this side, which the energy is distributed across the brain with one side, in this case, dominating, where the energy is focused in the reds and the yellows um, on one side of the brain. With bioral beats, you create what's called whole brain entrainment, where both hemispheres of the brain, both the creative side and the analytical side, harmonize and work together. This is the ideal state of learning, the ideal state for absorbing information, taking it into consciousness and committing it um, to long-term memory, and also having profound effects, uh, very strong effects, suggestive effects, um, on the human brain and, and subsequent behaviors. As a result, over 60,000 people were tested at the Monroe Institute utilizing um, this technology and actual um, tapes and CDs were developed for creating very specific behavioral effects for enhancing human performance, not for necessarily military applications, but for civilian applications um, in a number of areas. And we'll talk about that as we go on uh, through this presentation today. The, the main interest, again, um, of many was the idea of being able to enhance performance. I mean, consider the fact that um, brain activity in young children, how do we moderate that now? I mean, when kids are hyperactive, we drug them. When they're attention deficit disordered for other reasons, we drug them. And the idea there is, is to get them to slow down enough in order to make the kinds of um, intellectual processes work so that things do work properly. Now there's other ways to accomplish this, and one of the most outstanding programs in the country was actually initiated in a charter school in the Minneapolis School District. Minneapolis School District set up a charter school where they only allowed children in, essentially, who were attention deficit disordered. Eighty percent of the children were on Ritalin, a drug used, again, to modify their behavior so they can learn. What they found is using a technique called brain biofeedback or neurobiofeedback that they were able to modify um, the, these children's brain activities in this way. Essentially, it was a, a, a computer screen that would have like a visual image that a young child could um, relate to, more, more like a game than anything else. So you get 
a bouncing ball, for instance, the kid would be wired up. He'd have a 16 or 8 or, or 8 channel EEG plugged onto his head. So he'd have all these points covered on the head. Now they make really cool little helmets. They look like a bicycle helmet, so kids will tolerate them without all the electrodes stuck to them. Um, but it's a nice little arrangement where they look at the screen, and as their brain hits the right range for that ideal state of learning, the ball will bounce. And the higher it bounces, the more into that zone the child's brain activity um, is. And what they have found is that with 30 to 40 one-hour sessions with each child, they're able to actually train the child so that they can literally go into that ideal state of learning at will. In other words, they don't need the biofeedback apparatus. It's like a training tool. It's the same as if you try and learn how to ride a bicycle uh, out of a textbook. It's not going to work very good when you get on it the first time. But if you get on that bicycle and you fall down two or three times and you learn how to ride it at five or six years old and you never picked up a bicycle again until you were in your 20s and you grab that bicycle, you would immediately have laid down those necessary learning tracks to pick it up because of that feedback you get from the experience of actually all of your sensory um, perceptions being engaged in the learning activity. When you look at brain biofeedback, it's essentially the same kind of focused learning that allows you to retain, lay down those tracks so that you can go there at will. What did Minneapolis School District find out? After the first year, 80% of the student body was off of Ritalin, off of all psychoactive drugs. We're able to move gradually back into regular education programs, not needing uh, the special education um, resources uh, that otherwise would be demanded throughout their uh, 12 years of K through 12 education. Now, why is that important? Obviously, for the individual, I think it's obvious. But as, as taxpayers and people concerned about what goes on in our communities, special education is one of the biggest growing costs around the country. It's something that other school districts should be act actively engaged in. And it's something that you, as a, as a listener uh, to this DVD, could become an activist of one. Contact the Minneapolis School District get information on this program and get it into your local school district. You'll help a lot of kids and you'll reduce costs in your communities and actually begin to see technology applied in an educational environment. Now since Minneapolis had started this program, a number of school districts around the country are starting to uh, duplicate that program and bring it in uh, into the mainstream. But you know it's taken 20 years from the discovery of the technology to actually getting in to an educational environment where it might be useful. And if you ask uh, people involved in, in, in children's issues, this is probably one of the most important issues facing uh, children in public education around the country today. When you, when you look back on, on Monroe's work, you know, Monroe was doing some interesting things. He was trying to stimulate the brain, not just for learning applications, but also layer, layering uh, the information you would actually see a brain wave was actually put on uh, the material in such a way that the brain actually would lock onto that, that, that external signal. Now the other thing that, that Monroe uh, and others discovered is that you could combine bioral beat with flickering light. And let me give you an example. Most people think of the television set as a uh, light radiator is pretty harmless. You know you get back 10, 15 feet as most of us do and you watch a television set and it's pretty safe. Everyone says, you know, it's what's called non-ionizing radiation, radiation that doesn't generate a lot of heat. You're so far from it uh, and the way energy spreads out, as it spreads out and you get further away, the density or concentration of energy decreases dramatically. This explains why on a television set when you come up real close and you put your hand on that screen, you can feel that energy radiating but as you back off it gets less and less dense pretty rapidly within just a few inches. If you think about uh, radio frequency energy being broadcast from a radio transmitter, you know when it starts out and you're close to the transmitter, you hear the signal real clearly and the further and further and further you get away, the less dense that signal is and the weaker the signal becomes. When you think about um, energy oscillators and light in particular, think back um, a number of years ago, in fact now it would have been in the late 1990s, there was an incident in uh, Japan where actually children, 700 children watching a television cartoon uh, actually went to the hospital with epileptic seizures. What caused those epileptic seizures when light is supposed to be harmless, particularly that coming off of television? It was the flicker rate. That's what was determined. The rate in which a certain segment flickered 
or pulsed, it struck what's called a window frequency. Within the range, there are certain frequencies like dialing up a radio. In between, you get static, no signal, no clear resonance between transmitter and receiver. Yet when you hit the station, you get a nice clear signal. The same is true within our physiology, within our brains and within our bodies. Most energy is static between the stations. But when you hit that window frequency, you can trigger this cascading chemical reactions uh, within the human brain. In that case, it, it took 700 children uh, to the hospital with energy otherwise thought to be harmless. Capitalizing on this knowledge, people have developed technology that focuses in on those window frequencies for enhanced human performance, whether it's to help you sleep, to cause you to slow down, relax, and go into those deeper states of sleep, or whether it's to perk you up, to gain energy so that you can move forward in a day with a lot more vigor and a lot more energy, or whether it's for those accelerating learning applications where in the background you could be either playing by oral beat or you could be utilizing this technology to feed information in, putting the brain into that ideal state for learning, and then bringing the information in in a way that the brain can absorb it readily, retain it, and, and actually be able to use uh, that, that information in a much more effective way uh, in the future. The other place is, is just general meditation, where people want to get into those deep states of meditation, where they open their consciousness to their more creative capacities. And these are essentially the ways in which these technologies have evolved. And they've evolved in a number of different directions. Light and sound devices, and we're going to demonstrate some of that a little bit later. Um, electrocranial stimulation, using electromagnetic fields to stimulate the brain. And we'll demonstrate what that looks like a little bit later. And also the, the concept of biofeedback, being able to get a signal in and being able to understand that signal in a way that causes us to slow down or to um, be able to learn how to relax. Stress is probably the single biggest killer in the world today. If you really look at stress-related illness, whether they're uh, psychologically based or physically based, um, stress is the root of many of the illnesses we see today. And as our uh, societies become more complex, the tools for relaxation become extremely important. So we're going to get into a little bit of that as we go through the day. The other area that gets interesting is this whole idea of electromagnetic fields affecting our body. And you know, this is a source of a lot of controversy and a lot of serious science. You know, behind me are a number of books and publications on bioelectromagnetism, electromagnetic fields, um, power line cover-up, cell phones, lots of information that has been published um, some in the mainstream uh, science community and, and, and other in just the mainstream media reporting on the findings. And, and what is being reported today is pretty exciting stuff. The opportunities to enhance what we are as human beings, to become more complete. I mean, if you think about right brain, left brain arguments, you know, that, that went on in the, I remember mainly from the 80s where everyone was saying, you know, Women are more creative, so they, do, they have one portion of the brain that dominates, whereas men are more analytical, so another portion of the brain it dominates. And if you really look at, at these uh, EEGs and, and brain activity within human beings, you will see exactly that. But does that mean that one side or the other side uh, should be more dominant? It's really a function of our education system. If you look at young children, you see a more balanced um, hemispheric balance between both sides of the brain, the creative and the analytical. As we go through formal education, we tend to drift one way or the other and become channel locked into what parts of the brains dominate. Ideally, both sides work together, the analytical and the creative, and the idea of enhancing performance on both hemispheres is the objective of, of, of the science of uh, controlling the mind for your own advancement. Understanding a little bit more about the body and energy interactions with the body, you know the, the chemical model was the dominant model of the last century. This was the idea that everything that happens within our physical health and within our mind is related to chemical uh, interactions. What's being, what was a, really a big controversy toward, towards the end of the last century and, and, and not so much in the beginning of this one is the idea that energetically what happens to us has profound effects on, on our health and our, and our psyche. If you think about the body, um, not some, so much from the chemical compounds to, uh, to body cells, to body components, to body, but go a little bit deeper. Think about the body first energetically. Energy, atoms, 
molecules, collections of atoms, chemicals, body parts, and then body. Starting at the very lowest level, energy can have a profound effect in terms of how our bodies work. And sort of the dividing line between the sciences. You know, often um, the folks that had really strong math skills and capabilities in mathematics went into physics and quantum physics. Those that had lesser math skills but had good science minds tended to go uh, more towards the uh, chemistry and the uh, physiology and the health fields, other areas. And that break point really segregated the knowledge in a way that was not a good, good idea in terms of the West because we lost the understanding of what was happening behind those chemical reactions and how you might be able to manipulate chemical reactions not with other chemicals but just using energy itself. Now, the military actually commissioned a study back in the mid-80s. It was done through the University of Utah, and it resulted in the Radio Frequency Dosimetry Handbook, published in 1985. Now, this handbook was actually put together to just look at radio frequency energy and its effect on our, on our health and on our mind. And what they were able to find is that every major organ of the body, including the brain, the heart, the liver, the lungs, could all be interfered with or overridden by external signals in the radio frequency range within a very narrow bandwidth. In other words, again, looking at the analogy of the radio station and dialing through the stations, when you have resonance, a correspondence, a harmony between the transmitter and the receiver, that's where the energy exchange happens, that's where the action is. For a radio station, it means a nice clean sound. In the case of the human body, it means the efficient operation of an organ or the interference with its efficient operation for military advantage. Now, some people will remember seeing some of the devices that were uh, announced at the very end of the last decade. One of them for riot control purposes, and it was a microwave a transmitter mounted on the Humvee, and it was used for creating the sensation of heat energy on the surface of the skin. You know, and when you think about creating heat energy, what was it doing? It made you feel like you had 130 to 140 degrees uh, temperature, very irritating. Um, you know, in fact, burning the last time it was used to modify uh, human behavior was back in the Middle Ages, and we kind of gave that idea up of it as inhumane. But we brought it back. Now, what they didn't tell us about that particular device is that same radio frequency energy, if you oscillate uh, or you change the oscillation or the frequency, if you change the waveform and power densities or any other any of a number of perimeters, you can create much different effects. The Radio Frequency Dosimetry Handbook, commissioned by the United States Air Force, explains what those varying effects are, whether it's interfering with the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, or in fact just um, controlling behavior by agitating people uh, in terms of creating the heat sensation. But the idea of the military moving into this realm has, has become really uh, moved from the area of science fiction to science fact. In fact, uh, after 9-11, some other interesting ideas started being fielded. One of them was um, utilizing the knowledge of the brain um, to really look at, in the same way you walk through a metal detector to find out whether you're carrying the gun. Uh, the, the idea was being put forward uh, by, by a group of electrical engineers that what we could do um, is capture the signal intelligence. In other words, the brain activity of those passing through a receiver so that we could actually look at people that were experiencing high degrees of agitation or fear, the kinds of emotions that might make um, someone more of, a, of an interest uh, before they board a plane. Although I think a lot of people have fear of flying, so you'd get a lot of false reads as well. But these are the kinds of ideas that are being kicked around uh, by military planners around the world. When you think about, again, the body as a, uh, in terms of its energy and the way we relate to energy, this is a very, very important concept. And it goes back to the very ancients. You know, earlier in this presentation, I talked about the idea that around us is 200 million times more radio frequency energy than the Earth naturally produces. That radio frequency energy has been made by mankind and only includes one very small part of this continuum called the electromagnetic spectrum. When you add up all the energy, that man has added into an environment. It's a tremendous difference. The idea of um, uh, being immersed in a sea of energy and not really sensing it or noting it, I'll tell you when you really see the difference. When power grids shut down, 
most people immediately notice how quiet it is because the refrigerator's not humming, the fan motors aren't humming in your computer, and so on. But if you think of the general state of your body when the energy fails, it's almost like you've <sighs> exhaled as your whole body relaxes. Think about it the next time the power goes out. Or if you want to run an experiment at home, go to your circuit breaker in your house and break the power coming into your house and notice the difference as your body relaxes. Because your body constantly has to create equilibrium. So a certain level of stress is created within our physiology, within our bodies, to mitigate, to compensate for those external fields that dominate so much of our lives today. I mean, just in the room that I'm standing in today, we are surrounded by a 60 hertz grid, 60 pulses per second. This is in the high beta range. This is an agitating range for the human body. And so we're always in this constant state in the United States and Canada where we have 60 cycles, where we're always just a little bit on edge, and we only notice the change when the power goes out. The other thing that you notice is the connection. When you think about what do most of us do when we walk into our house? We kick off our shoes. Why do we do that? People say, well, I feel more relaxed. Why do you feel relaxed? When you think about the insulators on the bottom of your feet, you're separated by the ground, uh, you're separated from the ground. The Earth has a natural oscillation, a natural pulse. It's called Schumann's resonance. It was discovered uh, in Germany and Munich in the early 1950s. And the pulse rate of the planet is 7.83 hertz. 7.83 hertz, right in the middle of the alpha range, the ideal state for human learning, the ideal state for a creativity, and it happens to be the literal pulse of this planet. As we separate ourselves from that and lock on to those stronger energy fields now that are 60 cycles and higher, it explains a lot of the general stress that we see manifesting itself in the industrialized world that doesn't exist in the, uh, in, the, in the less industrialized parts of the planet. So that's an important consideration. Now, there was a, a segment that was run on the Discovery Channel a number of years ago, and it was on the Iceman, and many will remember this. They found this guy up in the uh, northern Italy, southern Germany, or Switzerland, depending on whose, whose side you're on on the argument, because apparently it was right on the border. And melting out of a glacier was this, a person that was 5,000 years old. Well, they began to look at what he was carrying, and, he, and they discovered that he had medicinal herbs and other things that we know about today, but we didn't know that they had this knowledge 5,000 years ago. As they were doing the autopsy on this man, what they found also was a number of tattoos covering his body. It just so happens that one of those people in the autopsy room noticed that these tattoos lined up with acupuncture points and acupuncture meridians. So they decided to take a look and see if this person actually had illnesses or disorders that were associated with those acupuncture points and acupuncture meridians. Not surprisingly to me, but surprisingly to, to those that were in the room, was in fact that knowledge was there. These points absolutely correlated. This reminds me of another story, and I'll, I'll tell you the story and then I'll bring the two together. A good friend of mine was a physicist um, specializing in, in the effects of... Um, electromagnetic energy on the human body. His name was Reho Michaela. And Dr. Michaela uh, lived in Finland. Um, he did a lot of work in uh, Australia. He did a lot of work around the world, but was extremely well known in his part of the world for understanding uh, the interactions between energy and human health. During his early work in the 70s, he began to, to take a look at mapping the human body. And what he discovered is all over the human body, there were places where our skin resistance differed. In other words, where there were concentrations of energy versus no concentration. He began to map these. He brought in graduate students, and this was done at Queensland University uh, in Australia. And what he found was that as he brought people in, tested them, that everybody manifested these exact same concentration points of energy. And he began to map them. He mapped the front and the back of the body through a number of years. And one day a guy came into his, in, into his study and said, Dr. Michaela, why do you have an acupuncture chart on the wall? And, and Dr. Michaela laughed and he goes, no, no, this is my work. I've been doing this for two years, measuring skin resistance on the surface of the body, the electrical properties on the surface of the skin. And the next day, that student went away and he brought one of these old uh, charts in. And this is uh, an, an interesting 
illustration. It's one of these kinds of diagrams. These are by the uh, ancient Chinese. We go back uh, thousands of years, but not 5,000 years, not the age of the Iceman. So where did the Iceman in Europe have the same knowledge as those in China? Back separated by thousands of miles as well as thousands of years. And this is, what, this is what my theory is, and this is strictly a theory, and I want to differentiate that from factual information, because that's what theories are, ideas that may help explain what we otherwise don't understand. Now, the arguments that we, we, we heard was, well, gee, how did the Chinese get the information into Europe? Or, how did the Europeans get the information into China? How about this idea? Take away all the background noise all of the things that we've created as mankind, take them out of the picture. And perhaps human beings, some human beings, were highly sensitive, were able to differentiate on the surface of the skin these very, very subtle differences uh, that Reho Michaela discovered um, 2,000 to 5,000 years after Europeans and Asians. Now let's go back and let's talk about this basic idea. This, this instrument this is um, a pointer plus, and this is actually an, uh, um, an acupuncture tool that has two functions. Its first function is to locate the points, to locate the acupuncture points on the body accurately by measuring the differences in the electrical properties on the surface of the skin. As an example, an acupuncture point on the index finger, on this side of the finger now, is, is well known and, and is charted in, in all of the charts, whether they go back to ancient China or, or modern, uh, the modern world. This device, uh, the Pointer Plus, is actually an, an, an electroacupuncture device. And the first thing I want to show is, is how it actually detects a point. And this will make um, a loop. So there's power coming through here, and there's a, a, a circuit that's completed um, if, I, if I actually go all the way around. So let me turn it on. There's power circulating through, and I'm locating a point. And when I hit that point, I get an auditory signal and I get a bright light. Now what I can also do is by depressing this trigger mechanism I actually send energy into that point that I perceive as a very very light um, almost like the dusting of a feather just a little slight pulsing sensation. If it's more than that the power is too high and it becomes uncomfortable. But basically what I'm doing instead of needling I'm sending in just a little bit of electrical energy to stimulate that particular point. But all of the points on the body can be found utilizing an instrument like this. Now, this is sort of the modern uh, uh, equivalent of those sensitives that could actually locate those points by their, their hypersensitive touch or their electronic sensitivity and be able to detect those very subtle differences. Because these acupuncture points don't line up with the normal nerve bundles. They don't line up with um, uh, muscle tissue. Um, they don't line up with um, the, the circulatory system or the, uh, of the body in terms of moving the blood around. This is a fourth system, the energetic system of the body, well known now and well understood. The place where I got my, my doctorate in traditional and complementary medicine was actually founded by a gentleman, Anton Jarasaraya, who was the first WHO fellow, World Health Organization fellow, to go into China and study acupuncture in the 50s and bring it back to the West in the 60s. But it wasn't until probably the latter part of the 1980s that the mainstream science finally accepted what the ancients have known forever, that affecting the energetic system of the body as a starting point is where health uh, practitioners in Asia uh, started and where they continue to operate today. This is probably the area where the most exciting breakthroughs in science uh, will emerge in our lifetimes. The idea of electrophysiology, electromedicine, will be the mainstays replacing what we've seen in the pharmaceutical models and the chemical models of the last century. That's what I think we need to look forward to, and in looking forward to that, it becomes a whole different system of addressing health. Uh, unlike chemicals, which work very quickly, this type of approach to health tends to take a little bit more time, and it's not just the effect of um, affecting the energetic system of the body, but also making sure the body has the basic nutrients available to it through the foods we eat or the supplements we take, again, getting back to the things that we've sort of lost in our modern diets. We need the right building blocks in the body, then we need to be in the right energy state to take advantage of those building blocks to build um, uh, a healthy body and a healthy mind. And that's what the future offers, 
and a lot of what we're going to be talking about today um, is about. This particular device is one that, that we think is quite useful, um, has been used all over the world, and there's lots of different versions of this, and we'll show another version of this as we get through the day. All right, we're going to demonstrate some of these basic tools. I'm going to make myself a little bit more comfortable. It's a little bit warm in here with all the lights. Um, but we want to get a little bit more of a, um, a practical look at sort of how some of these tools that I've been talking about really work, what they do, and um, in some of the ways that they can be beneficial uh, in, in our own lives. And again, to kind of take away, you know, so much of my work in the past has, has been centered on military activities, military affairs, and sort of the sinister uses of good technology. And, you know, technology is a two-edged sword uh, in, in, in real terms. You know, a truck can be used to deliver your mail or it can be used by a uh, bomber to blow up your house. So technology is not bad in and of itself. It's really the intent of the operator. And in this case, these are tools that, that I consider tools that deliver to individuals the power to take control over certain parts of our life and enhance um, our own innate natural abilities in ways that allow us to better perform. Light and sound I've talked a little bit about in terms of sort of the negative effects I mentioned um, in one of the earlier segments, this discussion about the Japanese kids that were watching a cartoon um, had uh, this epileptic uh, seizures event. Now, an important thing to note about light and sound devices. If you have any history of epilepsy, you cannot use these technologies because the light itself will trigger those kinds of seizures in people that are already um, uh, very sensitive in that area. That's why your physician tells you not to go into uh, bars or clubs or dance halls where they have uh, strobe lights flashing, for instance, if you have history of, of epilepsy. You can, however, use the sound uh, component, the bioral beat, um, and there's never been any uh, reports of uh, adverse um, actions there because it's strictly just sound um, creating an entrainment effect for a very, very specific um, type of enhancement. But this is a device, the Orion Light and Sound. It essentially is a headset and a pair of, uh, of glasses. Now, the, the thing with light devices is you don't keep your eyes open. Uh, when you put these glasses on, you actually close your eyes and you'll see when I turn this on, you'll see the little flickering uh, light. You can adjust the light volume, but you close the eyes, and the light actually easily passes through the eyelids, um, and you have the same effect. But again, you're more relaxed uh, state uh, when you can close your eyes. So the first thing is to set a program. This particular device has a little over 20 preset programs, and this is the one that I use predominantly. There are more sophisticated devices that you can self-program, you can do a lot of other things with. Um, I particularly like this because it's simple. It has three buttons <laughs> and an on and off switch. Uh, that's that's uh, the, the Nick Baggage three button rule. If it's got more than that, it gets too complicated for most people to use as a practical matter. Now, this device is used prim primarily for four main areas. Although there's 20 different programs, those four areas are meditation, relaxation, accelerated learning, uh, and um, enhancing creative, uh, creative work or creative capacity. Now, within those uh, areas, this device through bioral beat, and that's again to remind, r remind folks, this is where a sound signal comes in at one frequency in one ear, and another frequency in the other ear. So for instance, within the range of human hearing, approximately 1,500 cycles per second to about 20,000 cycles per second. This is the range, the frequency range for most human beings. Some can get um, very sensitive hearing that maybe goes down to lower frequency. Some have a higher frequency sensitivity and can hear a little bit beyond that range, but that's pretty much the range um, of, of uh, human beings. Marine mammals, um, for instance, uh, uh, dolphins can hear uh, up to 250,000 cycles per second, much, much beyond in the high frequency range beyond a human being. Uh, elephants, on the other hand, can hear in the very, very low frequency range, the ELF range, below 100 cycles per second. In fact, just as a, a point of interest, you know, people were kind of mystified um, in this recent tsunami in uh, Asia because the animals didn't appear to have suffered in the way that human beings had, and people were wondering, you know, what actually happened. A sound wave traveling through the water, through the oceans and through land, actually travels three times to four times faster than that 
um, surface wave of actual tidal wave action coming. So animals that can hear low frequency sounds actually heard it um, coming at them several uh, hours before the actual wave uh, hit. They actually heard the earthquake go. For those of us that live in earthquake regions, most of us know that before the earthquake hits, there's usually an auditory signal. You actually hear it coming, uh, like a freight train coming down the track. So animals with that sensitivity actually pick it up, but for the brain to hear low frequency sounds, you need this bioral beat, this cancellation effect where the signals cancel. So say one signal comes in again at 16,000 cycles, per second or pulses per second in one ear, 16,007 comes in at the other ear, they cancel and leave that beat frequency of 7 hertz. Essentially, that's how light and sound uh, devices work. And what you'll see when I activate uh, this particular unit, you'll actually see the, um, the flickering effect uh, of the lights. And let me turn the volume of that uh, flicker up so you can actually see it contrasting um, in this particular light. So it's that flicker effect. As you're watching the light flicker, um, it literally, the brain entrains to the flicker rate, changing brain chemistry, altering, altering consciousness, and changing uh, your mental state and, and your ability to either absorb information, relax, meditate, um, or engage in creative work. Now the other interesting thing about um, these devices is again, they're simple to use or relatively, this is probably the least expensive device on the market. Others get much more complicated. This one, uh, in particular, will actually interface with a computer. So you can plug into your computer. This one has um, over 60 preset functions, as well as you can adjust um, the time, the volume, the intensity, the tone, the frequency, the pitch, and the mode. So you can change any number of these perimeters and create your own. This is more for um, uh, really advanced researchers in light and sound technologies. It's not recommended for the average person. It's too complicated, too much, um, uh, too many, too many perimeters, and without a lot of basic knowledge, these are not very useful as a practical matter. The simpler um, units much, are, are much more effective. The other thing that I don't care for is an interface directly with the computer. The interface in this case goes into a central website where you can download additional programs into your computer and run them. I don't like that kind of interface. I prefer to deal with uh, material off the web um, for a number of reasons. But nonetheless, uh, good technology, very stout technology and used uh, now uh, literally around the world. Now there were some individuals that had made specific health claims related uh, to these kinds of devices. They are no longer on the market. FDA shut them down. Uh, the very same devices are still available without the claims associated with them. The main thing is the light effects are well understood. Um, the other thing that, that happens with light and sound devices is your blood chemistry changes. You can actually measure blood chemistry. You can actually see those changes within the blood workups. Um, and you can actually look at how your body's reacting to light and sound. And this is something that has been done. Um, we actually published a publication in the Earth Pulse Flashpoints. Um, it's an actual 60-page uh, uh, booklet that breaks down, I think, four or five studies of light and sound devices specifically. So folks that are more interested in getting follow-on data, um, it's available there. Um, you can also go on the web, and tremendous amount of information is available out there today on light and sound devices. Another device for brain entrainment, and one that, um, th that I no longer carry, and one that I don't really care too much for, but I want to at least demonstrate a little bit for um, uh, purposes of knowing there's lots of ways to get energy into the body to have these very same changes. In this case, uh, the reason I don't like it is it requ requires a um, uh, four uh, contact points. And this is done with a headband. This has gotten a little bit of use, but you need contact gels. So that's the first thing I don't like about it is the idea that you have to have um, moistened material when it makes contact with the skin so you get good con conductivity. Uh, in this case, what happens is essentially very similar. This is the on and off switch and sets the power level. This switch actually sets the frequency, and this, this frequency range, ranges from a fraction of a hertz up to about 12 and a half hertz, which covers all of those main areas that we're interested in, the delta, the theta, um, the alpha, and the beta ranges in the, in the low beta ranges. And for learning, for concentration, for relaxation, essentially exactly the same uses as light and sound, but in this case, we're using electric current. We're, look, we're using electric current 
rather than light or sound to carry um, that pulse rate. And so, as an example, I'm not going to hook this up to my head, but I'll give you an example. If we make contact so that you can see what, what happens with the meter, we'll kick the power up high enough. And as I said, you need a little bit of moisture. So I'm going to wet that a little bit. And what you'll see is a needle will pulse within the green range. You see that pulse rate? And that's essentially electrical energy coming into the body. Um, in this case, it would be these electrodes would be placed in this location. There would be two here, approximately, and two behind the ears. So you get across the cranium this pulsing, stimulating field the electromagnetic field the brain locks onto and begins to mirror the effect much in the same way, exactly the same way as the light and sound device. In this case, a little sloppier to use, a little tougher to use, as you just saw, um, but an interesting device nonetheless. These are, um, I've not seen very many of these left on the market, mainly because of the inconvenience of use. But again, several ways um, to get the brain to oscillate uh, in, in a different way at a different beat frequency. One of the other uh, interesting areas when you talk about the energetic system of the body, you know, I want to go back for a moment to the idea of um, electroacupuncture, which we were talking about briefly. There was, uh, there's been other observations about energy and the human body uh, back in the 30s, actually, 1930s, uh, in Eastern Europe, um, the development of uh, Carillion uh, photography. Uh, and this is the idea of being able to photograph the energy um, discharging from the human body. In this case, uh, these are my fingertips, and this is photographed um, by putting my fingertips within an electromagnetic field generated by a Tesla coil, and by touching a photographic plate in the dark, what happens is the photographic film actually catches photon, energy and light discharges coming off of the surface of the skin, in this case, uh, my fingertips. Uh, the, the camera that was used is a Carillion camera, this is um, an example of one. Now, you see uh, people who purport to have Carillion cameras in, uh, often in, in fairs, New Age shows, this kind of thing. Um, they're not necessarily the true Carillion photography. What they're doing is measuring skin resistances on the surface of the hands when you pla put, place them on a plate. And those skin uh, resistance differentials give you some variability so you get some energy patterns. The original uh, cameras, actually, you would have to touch um, a conductor. This, this conductive material which actually loops through and so when you touch that photographic plate you actually do get a bit of a shock. I mean it, your tendency is to pull away, it won't hurt you but it's um, a little bit uncomfortable. So while you're getting that energy discharge and you're placing your hands in the dark through a sleeve to where you're actually touching uh, what is a photographic plate uh, on the inside and this is the inside where the photographic plate would actually make contact um, to the skin. So the Carillion cameras are interesting for demonstrating uh, that there is actually this energy uh, uh, coming from the body. Now, one of the other instruments that um, we didn't demonstrate, this one has a single function. This one strictly locates the acupuncture points. This can be used for massage therapy, um, acupressure, where you're not using needling, but you want to be accurate. You want to hit specific points that may affect very specific parts of our physiology. So what happens here is again, you have to make physical contact, you have to loop around, so in this case, you have the probe to help locate the point, and then you have to have a conductor, you have to be able to physically uh, complete that circuit, so the electricity can flow through the entire body and be amplified in those specific points where you get um, a, a signal. And in this case, what you'll see, uh, there's an acupuncture point again on the inside of my uh, index finger, so I'm going to try and locate that point, and as you can see, very efficiently, I find that point both with a light and a sound signal. And as soon as I move off the point, the intensity of the signal decreases. Now, this has a sensitivity knob, and the reason it has it is everyone's skin resistance is a little bit different. So some people with particularly dry skin might have to turn it up really high in order to pick up all of the points on the body. On the other hand, places on the body where there's lots of energy being discharged, like the palms of the hand and the, and the uh, soles of the feet, you'd want to kick the sensitivity down. And I'll give you a good um, example of that. As I touch anywhere on the surface of my hand, you can see that it picks up a signal, even though there's no particular point associated in that way. If I cut it down, 
in power, it'll only locate the points that are actually there. And I'll have to mess around with it a little bit to find those fire points within the hand. Uh, you, can, you can adjust it. But basically, it's an adjustment to sensitivity. Again, taking into consideration skin resistance, the very thing that allows us to find the points in the first place and the variability between people so that one device can work for all. This one is, is an excellent device for locating points. It's a low cost device for doing that, but it doesn't energize the points. Now the, the other device that I had shown earlier, this one also has both the locator function and the energizing function. And, and, and why I like this device is it's portable, it's easy to use, it's the one I travel with. The other reason I like it is, is I'm not big on needling, <laughs> you know, and most, most Westerners aren't. You know, when you talk about acupuncture, usually the first reaction you get is, <gasps> I don't want any needles in me. This is another way to deliver energy to the body, avoiding the needling and the discomfort associated with it. This is not an uncomfortable sensation, but a very powerful one, because even in the needling, there's a certain amount of interaction between the person operating uh, that needle um, and, and, the, and the person that's receiving that needle. In this case, energy is deliberately pushed in. Now, my friend, uh, Rejo Michaela, Dr. Michaela, who I had mentioned earlier, went a step further, and he developed an electro uh, laser system for, for acupuncture. And in this case, he uses a class four laser. This isn't a laser that burns tissue or burns material. It's right below that level. It's very powerful. It's not like one of these little pointers that you see in the uh, novelty shops and in lectures um, often these small um, lasers. It's something in between the burning laser and the pointing laser, the, the class three. And what they were able to do is take the class three laser, which has about a two and a half millimeter uh, head where the light actually comes out, and then around that head place an electrode that actually pulses energy in that harmonizes with the light energy that's also going in, but a much, much different effect. As an example, when I went to see Rejo in uh, 1994, I, I spent a week with him in his lab and his, um, actually his clinic. He took this system into Finland um, and actually was challenged by the medical authorities there, similar to our American Medical Association here. They challenged him all the way to the, the, the highest court in the land in Finland. And, and my friend Rejo Michaela won his case and was able to train 15 practitioners in electrolaser methods before he passed away, a method permitted by the medical authorities uh, in Finland and in other European countries today and practiced by very few practitioners uh, within the United States. But here's what he did for me. Rejo first took a look at my general health utilizing you know, the normal tools of an MD. You know, you, you check blood pressure and temperature and all the basic perimeters that, that most physicians uh, engage in. The other thing he did is, is, is take a look at um, not my blood work, but, a, but my urine, and analyze that. And, and he's also an iridiologist, someone that studies the iris and can connect um, disorders within the body to manifestations that show up in the iris. And iridiology is well known. Anyone who studies this field will find um, very similar things. The body projects through the eyes um, its, its state of health. And so Rejo analyzed uh, using the traditional Western methods and non-traditional uh, methods my health and he concluded that I had had a pneumonia at one time or some some lung disorder that caused me um, to have scarring in one lung that was significant uh, comparably to the other. Now that was interesting because what Rejo didn't know is a couple of years before I had had double pneumonia and had been hospitalized and that was exactly my condition. So what he said was that he was going to show me how electrolaser acupuncture works in rechanneling energy in the body. So the first thing he did is he went through um, a, 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 a liver point. And, and this liver point, what he did, excuse me, this lung point, what he did was he wanted to show me how energy could come into the body, affect the primary lung points, which are on the chest. And what he said is, without coming anywhere near my chest area, but affecting other lung points in the ear, he was able to show energy coming through the body. And what you saw on my chest was two red dots about the size of a dime, about one cent centimeter in diameter, appear on my chest. No contact, perfectly circular in form, one very much intensely red and the other one sort of a dull pinkish color, correlating with which lung had the most damage and which lung didn't. Now, what also I noticed, 
coming through that point where the energy was coming in through the ear was a, a first starting as a slight like pulsing sensation and then getting more intense till it was a pinching a rhythmic pinching sensation until it became so intense I couldn't stand it anymore and I had to have him take the instrument away. Now, what he said to me, and, and, and again, looking at my general physiology, my liver was in excellent shape, so he went through a liver point, never adjusted the settings on the instrument as far as intensity, and on that setting, going through the liver, which was functioning normally, there was no sense of pain, just that slight oscillating pulsing sensation but it never elevated, it never increased. And why it never increased is the energy flowed through the acupuncture meridians and came back around flowing through the meridians as it was supposed to, as it was intended, not getting blocked, where then skin resistance, the blockage actually sent the energy back to the point of entry, creating an irritation on the nerve endings at that point of entry, which is where that pain in the ear points came in when they were trying to affect my lungs. Now. What was interesting about all of that is to see that physical manifestation, to see that energy delivered where those primary lung points clearly show it. Now, how did this process work in treating patients? And Rejo, before he died, treated over 16,000 uh, patients with a number of different disorders. And what happened in, in a week to six week treatments, because you'd go in every day for 30 minutes and get the same treatment five days a week, sometimes for a week, sometimes six or eight weeks, depending on the disorder. Because this system of acupuncture, acupuncture generally, does not work instantly in many, many cases. It takes time. The kinds of things that Rejo was treating, things that are considered incurable uh, in the West. He treated successfully MS, diabetes, um, various forms of cancer. When people say they've got a cure for cancer, be a little bit skeptical in the sense that there's over 700 types of cancer, so people need to be a little bit more specific. Ray Ho had uh, success with very narrow bands um, of cancer and other disorders within the body. But his work, what was interesting about it is, is, is being carried forward, but it didn't just include electrolaser acupuncture. It also included the proper nutrient supplements and the proper foods uh, in order to make sure that the building blocks for the body were also present as you try to rebalance the system so that energy flows and then what, what manifests from that is essentially good health. The other um, instruments, this is uh, one of the earlier instruments that I became acquainted with. Again, another electroacupuncture instrument. This one um, has a uh, locator function as well as a um, ability to discharge energy. It uses more of a point it has more of an irritation when it makes contact with the skin, um, so it's one that I don't particularly care for. I like um, the manual, however, that came with this was an excellent, um, excellent book, uh, Simple Health Maintenance. Unfortunately, the book is not available in the United States, but very similar um, titles are. And these books basically will break down um, a disorder. Um, it'll it'll lay out then the appropriate points to treat. It'll lay out uh, generally um, what uh, supplements that a person would need to also take um, as you're rebalancing the body. And, and you'll see lots of different um, purposes for acupuncture, this written specifically for laser electroacupuncture. But there are many, many books available uh, for this purpose. Um, when you look at acupuncture uh, titles, um, any of them are, 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 are good. One of the ones that we carry, uh, Healing with Pressure Point Therapy, this one actually breaks down a hundred common um, ailments and then uh, actually lays out uh, not just the uh, points that you would treat, but also um, the, the uh, nutri nutrition, uh, nutritional supplements, uh, foods that are beneficial for also affecting uh, those particular ailments. The Chinese developed really good systems and the main, the main thing to, to know is it's not any particular book. Find the one uh, that you're the most comfortable with. You know, every um, person in the healing arts uh, specializes, even in the acupuncture areas. So when you go um, to the Barnes and Nobles or the Amazon.coms or the bookstores of your choice, look at the acupuncture section and generally there's usually seven or eight or even ten titles. Take a look at which one best address the issues that you're interested in and that's the book for you. The points all line up the same. Um, it's really the, the depth of experience that the practitioner has in terms of supplements, dietary habits, and the other things that they recommend that go along with uh, acupuncture. And, and, and again, I would say 
the balance between uh, the Western science and the Asian sciences is a balance that, um, that, that should be paid attention to. In any case, thinking about acupuncture in the general sense as it applies to, as applies to us individually, striking that balance is really what it's about. It's good to get good medical advice before you use any technology, and once getting that medical advice, make informed decisions about what's good for your health. Uh, and again, these are tools to improve human performance, not necessarily replace uh, MDs um, or Western medicine as much as it is to supplement and complement. Uh, it's not an alternative, it's a complement uh, to the medicine that we all surround ourselves with today. And, and my view has always been approach things from the least invasive uh, to the most invasive. And I think this is where often we rush to sort of the last, um, the last step instead of the first step in the process of improving our health. So striking that balance uh, is, is probably uh, more important um, on the front end of, of disorders and disease and ailments to make sure we're making the right decisions for ourselves individually. The next area I want to talk a little bit about is, is this concept of biofeedback. And I mentioned brain biofeedback, and I don't have the instruments to demonstrate for that here. Um, but if you're interested in brain biofeedback, there is an organization in Denver, the, brain, uh, the, the Biofeedback Association. They're the only certifying body in the country. So if you're looking for a practitioner of biofeedback in your area, particularly the idea of being able to affect brain activity uh, for children or for adults, um, very useful in stroke recovery, um, addiction uh, issues, um, behavioral issues, and attention deficit issues. Um, uh, these are very, very useful. But Denver is where to call. Uh, if you call information there, Biofeedback Association, get the names of practitioners in your area, and then you can deal with, um, with those opportunities uh, as they come about. But on a, on a more localized scale, what is within the range of people's ability to do? Uh, this particular device I like, this is just for relaxation. And it incorporates what are called muscle tensiometers, which are these three small metal discs. And what they do is they pick up um, energy from the body, uh, translate that energy in terms of muscle tension. And when you, when you tense up your muscles, there's actual uh, changes in skin resistance on the surface of the skin that can be measured. So what happens, well, many people know the uh, concept of kinesiology as an example. Kinesiology uh, people use, and it's where they're, and, and if you don't know what the word is, you'll maybe remember the image. It's somebody holding some substance in one hand, and there's somebody pushing their arm down with the other, and they're, and they're seeing how much muscle resistance there is. So maybe you hold aluminum in this hand, and it has a detrimental effect on you, so you're weak. Or you hold something in this hand that gives you strength, and then they can't you know, break the arm down. But it's all subjective. I mean, you don't really know, is he really pushing as hard? Muscle tensiometers you can actually put around this portion of the arm, and they actually measure muscle tension, so it is objective, not subjective. In other words, you can see a needle or a digital readout and see exactly what's going on with the muscle. Incorporating muscle tensiometers, in this case, these three um, points fit into a headband, it fits on the head, so these three points hit right about here. And if you ever notice when someone's stressed, they wrinkle up their brow when they're relaxed. The muscles here are very, very relaxed. So what happens with this device, as your muscles tense, you get in, in the headset a very high-pitched sound. And as you relax, the sound goes down. So it goes real high. And the lower you get the sound, the more relaxed your body is. So you get feedback. You get that interaction, like learning how to ride the bicycle, the example I used earlier. You know, it's doing it without the feedback makes it very tough. You know, meditators spend 20 years learning how to meditate, sometimes, 20 years. Now, why does it take so long? It's because when they hit that ideal zone, it's for that few seconds, and they remember, ah, oh, that's, that's what that feels like. The next time it's a little easier to get there, and the next time a little easier to get there. And then eventually they get to that place and they do it very efficiently. Now they want to dive deeper. In over 20 years, they learn how to dive deeper and recognize those signals. With feedback, with neurobiofeedback and brain biofeedback, it has been proven that people can reach the same mental state as the 20-year meditator using biofeedback once a day for an hour a day, learning how to drive to those lower states in 30 to 60 days.
That is phenomenal. And this isn't done anecdotally. This is done with thousands of trials showing how you can entrain the brain, drive the brain activity down, and then learn how to modulate your own brain activity. This particular device I, I no longer carry, but it is available through Tools for Exploration. You can find them on the internet. It's very simple. It's about a hundred bucks. It's the kind of tool that a guy can use at the end of a workday when you're totally stressed out and you just need to unwind. This helps you learn how to do it. After 30 to 60 days, you can put this on the shelf or hand it to somebody else because you can get there on your own. And that's a key thing in a busy, hectic life, being able to learn how to relax, reduce those stress levels, and recognize relaxation in terms of the general sense of the body and being able to get there quickly and efficiently, even midday, in the middle of the day with an intense schedule, it's nice to be able to create an environment where you can relax and learn how to really work with your own physiology to accomplish that. This instrument is also um, a biofeedback device. Uh, this device, uh, the Thought Stream, actually uh, measures skin resistance, in this case, with, an, with, with a, uh, a probe that fits on the palm where the palms sweat a little bit and you make a decent contact. When the device is clicked on, it actually has a headset, so you get an auditory signal, so you can close your eyes, you don't have to look for a visual signal, and you can relax. And it's the same basic idea. The sound starts very high up, and then drops down to a low, lower, lower, and lower pitch as you start to relax. Now, what I'm going to show with this device is I'm going to set it up so that it's, it's on, and what you'll see first is you'll see um, a light signal. And this is just the, the light signal setting itself um, for, for, for my energy state and for my skin resistance. And so as this signal gets to red, the objective is, is to get it to go from red to green, and it'll go red, orange, uh, and start to work its way down as I relax. So I'm going to try and relax just for a second here and see if we can get this to drop. Well, I guess making a film doesn't give me the chance. Well, there's a little bit. It's dropping a little bit down from, from the bright red. And if I relax, you'll see it drop down into the orange. And essentially, what this is doing is giving me a, a visual signal. At the same time, there's an auditory signal if I had the headset on, which would tell me that I'm getting more and more relaxed. And I can adjust the sensitivity on this instrument and the volume on the instrument so that um, I can get deeper and deeper and deeper into more relaxed states. This one's just a little more complicated than the headset. Of the two, the headset is the simpler technology to use. Now, they have more sophisticated brain biofeedback instruments. They run into the thousands of dollars. Um, the mind mirror is one which actually lays out with light bands that go across the, across the visual screen, um, both hemispheres of the brain. So you can not only slow the body down, but make sure both hemispheres are, are basically energized at the, approximately the same energy state. So you maintain that optimum uh, brain balancing performance at the same time that you're relaxing or going into those particular uh, mental states that you're desiring to, 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 to go to. So biofeedback is one way. This teaches you to do it on your own. Light and sound instruments drive you there. In other words, there is no learning. You're there within a minute um, and you stay there. People with sleep disorders, light and sound devices are extremely effective for putting you to sleep because they immediately entrain the brain into those relaxed states, uh, whereas this is a training tool uh, to learn how to do it yourself. The next instruments I want to I want to show really are some of the leading edge uh, instruments in, in technology and, and 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 devices that I'm particularly proud of. Uh, but first, let's go back for a moment uh, to this idea of, of hemispheric balance and brain and entrainment. Again, to remind uh, the viewers, the brain in normal state usually has one area or another that tends to dominate. Usually, it's on one side of the brain or the other, and the energy distribution across the brain is is not so uniform. Um, yet, when we use uh, brain enhancement technologies, in this case we're using Hemisync, we actually create a bioral beat. You can see the headset graphically illustrated. Both hemispheres of the brain then begin to resonate, harmonize. So they begin to, the energy distribution becomes even. And you can see from the red bands uh, and the various color bands how that energy distributes itself across the human brain. This idea, bioral beat, which I explained earlier, 
uh, actually ended up being put into uh, video or excuse me soundtracks. These soundtracks are CD or tapes, and essentially they're each designed for very specific things. Um, there's probably about a hundred of them out there now, different different uh, versions for different effects, whether it's attention deficit disorders, stress, enhanced learning, meditation, etc. We carry these because they work. Uh, one of the big things that as we looked out over all the things that are out there in the marketplace, we wanted something that has been proven uh, time and time again. Over 60,000 people went through the Monroe Institute in Virginia as they developed each of these programs. And so there's two separate tracks involved. One strictly uses tones and sound to create the effects, and sometimes they'll overlay, overlay on those tones and sounds, classical music, um, or what have you to make it more pleasant to listen to. But these tones and sounds, essentially you relax, the brain automatically tunes in, captures that bioral beat frequency, and begins to move um, as those uh, uh, CDs and tapes were designed. So for relaxation, learning, etc. The straight sound signals, for instance, for learning, uh, there's a couple of tracks where you can actually plug the sound signal in, put on your headset, and you must use a headset with Hemisync to be effective, and then read your material or, or watch your normal visual material. Um, but at that point, both hemispheres are working together. You're absorbing the information much more efficiently for language learning or any type of learning uh, applications. Extremely useful. Um, you can plug in, for instance, your lecture in your college class or a particular learning program that you're interested in. Virtually any um, auditory uh, information that you can get in, you can get in um, in conjunction with um, creating that uh, signal. Now, the other interesting thing and something I failed to mention when I was talking about light and sound devices is even the low-end light and sound devices will allow you to jack in an external um, audio input. In other words, that lecture or that audit, audit, auditory information that you want to commit to uh, memory or to learn. So there's lots of ways to get it in. Um, Hemisync is very effective. Now the other way that Hemisync is effective is they use um, subliminals. Now these subliminals are interesting in this regard. Um, if you turn the, uh, if you have a multi-track uh, stereo, you can actually hear exactly what the words are that are being said. And this is extremely important. You don't concentrate on the words, you concentrate on the music which gets you into that relaxed state and the and the words become the programming. Now the programming is important because words are symbols for thoughts and they mean different things to different people. So my words describing for instance a dog. For some people they get warm fuzzy feelings when they hear the word dog. Other people's get gripped with fear because their experiences aren't the same as yours. Word symbols have a lot to do with how you take the information in and you want to make sure those word symbols line up with your belief system. So subliminals, any subliminal, you want to know exactly what's said, exactly how that information is delivered before you um, subject yourself to it. Because here's what happens with all these technologies. They put you into a super suggestive state where the information flows past that normal filter that filters out right and wrong, good and evil, the things that line up with our beliefs and the things that don't and it dumps information directly in uh, to long-term memory. So you don't want to put information in that conflicts with your normal beliefs. Always look at your subliminals, no matter who's producing them, make sure they line up with your belief systems. Now I want to jump a little bit from Hemisync. Hemisync I also like because it's specific in the sense that if there's one thing you're particularly interested in achieving, whether it's learning or meditation, you can get one item to do the job. 20 bucks versus several hundred for more sophisticated equipment. Again, take the least costly, least um, invasive approach uh, to solving issues or problems or increasing performance and move from there. And Hemisync is, is really the least invasive of all technologies that I've demonstrated today. Now, the other technology I want to show a little bit about is it started with the uh, Flanagan uh, Neurophone. And this is a, um, a, a mid-level version. There were earlier versions going back to the 60s. Uh, more modern versions have been made. This is one that was hand-built by the inventor. Um, and actually, what this does is it uses a couple of, of things. And then I'm going to show you the advancements in the technology. What this does is take a sound signal. Now, normally, how does sound enter the body? This, this thing we call an ear is really an array. 
it actually captures the sound wave as it hits the body and this condenses the sound wave, the outer ear, into the inner ear where it then hits the eardrum, creates a vibration. On the other side of that eardrum is a little bit of fluid. That vibration moves through that fluid, begins to vibrate three small bones in, in, in the inner ear and then moves eventually to the eighth cranial nerve where an electromagnetic signal actually transits the nerve, ends up in the auditory portions of the brain where we hear what you hear today, sound. Now if I distort the array, if I distort my ear, both of them, and I close my eyes, and somebody jingles a set of keys, if I leave the ear as normal, I'll be able with pretty good accuracy to tell exact, pretty much where that, that sound is coming from. If I distort the array, it becomes much more difficult to isolate sound. So this isolates direction, isolates where sound is coming from. The next thing is that conditioning that happens in between. It's where the signal gets, gets transferred into a, a pattern, a pattern of transmission that the brain understands. Now, what Patrick Flanagan discovered was a way to replicate what the inner ear does. In other words, to take a sound signal, condition it in such a way so you can bring it in bypassing the eighth cranial nerve, normally thought to be responsible for all auditory input into the, into the brain, and you can actually perceive sound, bringing it in through other parts of the nervous system or perhaps that energetic system, that fourth system we talked about earlier, which is the acupuncture system of the body. The judge is still out on how the information gets in. Most recently, in the last few days, uh, there was a, an article in our local paper uh, talking about sound that's actually perceived from the auroral discharge. You know, some people hear it and some people don't. They really don't understand the mechanism by which that sound gets into the head. I'd suggest that it's a very similar mechanism to the one I'm about to demonstrate uh, today. Now, what what we did is we advanced the technology significantly. Um, a, a, an incredible inventor in Germany, uh, Robert uh, Thiedemann, actually took the old concepts of the uh, neurophonic technology, which included about a 30 board electronics, 30 uh, components on an electronic board in this box to create um, a sound that you could perceive literally in the center of the head. What we did is, is Robert took the ideas advanced them substantially and created a much finer circuit, over 170 components involved uh, in the design of this circuit which allowed us to get much deeper frequency ranges, lower frequency and much higher frequency range delivered into uh, the brain. Now what happens with this, unlike a, um, a standard auditory signal, the ears aren't involved. What happens is the signal is conditioned, in this case we're going to use a standard CD player I've got Bach playing on this CD player and as, as classical music. It's routed through this device, through its circuitry. About midway through the circuit, there is a, an electro-optical coupler. Now the electrical optical coupler changes a flow of electrons, the electricity, to a flow of photons, light energy, converts it back to electricity, where then it moves on to the body. Now we put that converter in there essentially to break the circuit because although we're attached just to a CD player if you hook this up to a home stereo or a computer where you're actually hooked into the wall with AC power you don't want power to arc across the circuit and into the body because at the end of this we're going to have what are called piezoelectric transducers they have a metal contact point and when we make contact with these we actually transit current through the body and if you listen carefully you'll hear a little bit of a energy discharge. These have um, a ceramic material on the back of these metal plates. As electric current hits that ceramic material, it causes it to expand and contract. And what that does is create a slight drumming effect on the surface of this metal plate. That drumming effect then creates a sound that you can hear with the normal ear. So for example, when I complete the circuit, right now you hear nothing. But if I complete the circuit by touching the other transducer with my fingertips, sound will transit through and you'll hear it. Now, what you, what you can't hear on the camera, but you can hear in the room, um, if I actually place this on my temples and block my outer ears, the sound is internalized. The sound is actually heard as if it were originating in the center of my cranium. Now when you're out of balance energetically, when you're looking more like this, what you'll find 
is the energy will stay on one side or the other. In other words, you'll perceive the sound as if it's sitting over here somewhere in your head. Within about a minute of use, the energy centers. As both hemispheres begin to beat together, you get exactly the same effect, only it's created as a condition of use, not the input signal. In other words, any input signal creates this kind of balance in both hemispheres. Where this has been particularly effective in Germany is the combination of hemisync technologies together um, with this delivery system. And the reason being is you're not just getting it through the normal auditory channel, you're getting it through another auditory channel, increasing the inputs. Now, when you listen to it, if you were actually to hook up, and you can with this instrument, you can hook up a regular headset and listen to that headset. You can then put on the piezoelectric transducers and what you end up with, with is a three-dimensional sound. The same kind of difference that you would perceive by listening to AM versus FM, where the sound volume and quality fills out with FM. Listening to FM versus this technology, it fills out one more level. So you even get more enhanced sound. For gaming and for some of those kinds of things, it could be quite interesting. But for um, brain en enhancement, body balancing, where this has been um, used, these technologies have been used, is by introducing electrons, which is essentially what you're doing. You're creating an energy flow through the body, electrons are being delivered to the body, they enhance your overall energetic state, they balance the hemispheres, they also balance the acupuncture meridians, and it shows up. A week or so later, your system is still in balance after about a half hour use, assuming that you don't experience some huge stress levels or some traumatic event which throws your equilibrium out. But generally speaking, it manages balance, allows for increased learning, enhanced uh, performance. Now this technology, as I said, was developed for Earth Pulse. Um, we hold the U.S. patents. Our colleagues in Germany hold the international patents for the technology. We are just introducing this as one of the leading edge learning technologies available now. Um, the idea behind this technology is again to advance it even further, to miniaturize the circuit. Where we're really excited is the potential applications for hearing impaired. Initially, as we tested the device, field tested the device, we found that certain individuals with hearing impairments or hearing loss, particularly in the high frequency range, were able to regain um, that high frequency loss. The other thing we found is sound signals above the normal range of hearing, up to the carrier frequency of 40,000 hertz, could be perceived by people using this. So you get even more range. If you listen to a standard headset and you listen for that high fidelity sound that's being laid down on the soundtrack with normal, normal headset, it only goes so far. You put on the transducers and it jumps another level. You actually catch the higher fidelity sound that otherwise you would totally miss. On the, audit, on, on the audio input, whether it's music or a lecture or, or some other uh, information. The sound wave, um, we have information available on it. You're welcome to write to us and get that information. We'll send it out to you in a booklet form that kind of explains what it's all about. Or you can go to our website, uh, which is at the bottom of the screen. The, the idea behind these technologies for us was the idea that we could advance and deliver technologies to the average person that would be useful. One of the other instruments that we'll be bringing out in the next couple of years, it's in prototypical design now, is one that measures subtle energy fields in and around the body um, and actually give you the feedback. Again, feedback is an extremely important process in, in accelerating learning processes. And if you study uh, most, uh, most of the um, areas of, of um, a philosophy and science where they kind of cross over. Um, you'll hear oftentimes people refer to energy centers within the body. Well, these energy centers can be measured. And they start, at, start approximately here, and they move up to the top of the head. Seven centers are generally involved. But it's always been subjective again, where, you know, is it really there, or is there really energy there? And there's a column that flows approximately six inches out from the body. With the instrument that my colleagues in Germany have developed, you can take the instrument, move it into the area of those energy centers and actually see a needle move. When you move out of the area of that energy center, the needle stops moving. So feedback, again, important. If you want to activate the heart center or the center in, in this area of the throat, you can actually see the needle, get the feedback, 
change your way of thinking, change your way of focusing your attention, and see if you can move the needle at will. That's where the feedback comes in for energy work in a number of fields. This instrument we think will be extraordinarily valuable and one that we look forward to bringing out in the future. The next area I want to talk about deals with, with sound and agriculture. In this particular book, Secrets of the Soil by Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird, is a book that we publish, and I consider it to be one of the most important books in alternative agriculture. One section of this book uh, deals with sound and the effect of sound on plants. In fact, it really goes back even further to an earlier book by the same author. It's called The Secret Lives of Plants, which is also a book that we carry. People remember from the 60s and 70s this whole idea of talking to plants and music affecting plant growth, and people would play classical music and get really excellent growth, and they play hard rock or really, really rough edge music, and plants would, um, would end up not being as healthy and not being as, um, as prolific in their growth. This particular um, chapter within Secrets of the Soil that I'm interested in deals with a product and a technology called Sonic Bloom. And it was developed um, by a gentleman who actually got the motivation for the technology in Vietnam. He was in Vietnam during the war. He saw lots of starvation, lots of poverty, and really wanted, set himself about trying to find a way to increase um, agricultural production. Intuitively, when he got back to the States, he was observing songbirds, and he drew a connection between songbirds and plant growth. And what he decided was that birds, for some reason, could stimulate plants to grow. And here's what he found, that in the morning, when the dew is settling on the leaves of plants and the birds start chirping right before sunrise, generally speaking, and extending for a little while after sunrise, what would happen is those sound signals generated by songbirds actually causes the pores on the leaves of plants to open. And when they open, the dew that's on the leaves of plants and the dust that settles on those leaves, and, and what does dust carry? It c carries colloidal minerals, very, very fine particles, mineral substances or pollutants or whatever happens to be in the air that settles on those leaves. The leaves pours open, sucking in the moisture and the particulate material with them and actually bringing nutrients into the plant in addition to the nutrients brought in through the root system. So what, 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 what this gentleman discovered was the idea that you could stimulate plants and you could add the right nutrients by spraying them as a foliar spray, spraying them on the leaves of plants, then playing the right sound sequences, not necessarily birds, and actually having them intake uh, more efficiently uh, those materials. But there was more going on there. There was more to it than that. There was actually a physicist in New, in New Jersey who was also a musician working on exactly the same idea. But he was looking at it from a different perspective. He was looking at what happened within the DNA when sound sequences were played um, and the mathematics of that. It was what fascinated him. And so what he determined was that you could actually create genetic alterations in the plants, making them more vibrant, and that this was probably the root to what was going on with sound, that Dan Carlson, the inventor of Sonic Bloom, discovered on the one hand, intuitively, the physicists discovered scientifically, both saying the same things. We wrote an article about that in uh, the Flashpoints, and there's also an article um, uh, on, on sound and the work of this physicist in, um, in, in other publications that we cite. The point being, um, huge differences in plant growth were achieved. I went to Dan Carlson's farm in, um, in Minnesota, actually right over the border of Minnesota into Wisconsin, and he showed me a number of things. This is an example of some of the um, some of the things that were going on with accelerated plant growth. And in an eight by sixteen foot plot, eight by sixteen feet, five thousand pounds of tomatoes were grown using this system. Phenomenal. In the same size plot, eight by sixteen feet, eight hundred cantaloupes were grown. And these aren't small; these were larger than normal. Um, I went to Dan's farm and actually took a look at the nut trees and plants that he was growing there, and these were the observations that, that I made. Firstly, on an elm tree. An elm tree normally has a leaf that if you looked at the leaf, it's sort of a tapered leaf about the size of two fingers. And I looked at a plant, um, a tree, that was um, 
probably 25 or 30 years old, and Dan had bought this farm 13 years before, and you could actually count from the top of the tree down. Another thing about an elm is as they grow, they not only get another ring, each branch cluster of five branches, when you look between those clusters, the vertical growth of about 10 inches to a foot um, represent one year of growth. So you can count the clusters down from the top of the tree, 13 years down to when Dan had, had purchased the farm. And what you would see is, in the 13 years that he had the farm, you didn't get 10 inches or 12 inches of growth. You got four feet or more of vertical growth between branch clusters. When you looked at the wood itself, it wasn't pulpy or had a bunch of voids in it. It was just as dense as the other wood. It just had much, much more uh, growth. Now then, when you looked at the seed that came off of that elm tree and next to that mother plant was the offspring that had grown over about a seven year period. And instead of the leaves being this big as they were on the mother plant, the offspring's leaves were the size of your hand. That difference was because the plant was genetically altered. So it didn't just affect its ongoing growth, but the offspring became much more potent and uh, much more um, energetic plants. The other thing, the fruit trees in, in his orchard uh, didn't have any pesticides whatsoever, but, but insects attack weak plants, not strong plants. They're part of that process of decaying the plant in order to break it down into soil. So they look, they're, they're nature's workhorses. They go into gardens to kill the dead, basically, and bring them, to the, bring them into the uh, formation of soil, whereas vigorous plants, you could see it. The insects would attack the outside of an apple, for instance, but never penetrate the skin. You just see a slight blemish and off they'd go. Um, the fact is, in hardwoods, instead of 75 year growth or 50 year growth for veneer grade black walnut, a plantation of over a thousand trees with 10 years of growth showed triple the density, triple the diameter growth. What is that worth? In black walnut, a 10 inch diameter uh, tree, 10 feet in length, um, represents uh, in veneer grade, approximately $10,000 in value. So tripling the speed of a, of a plant like this certainly has economic gains and benefits. Likewise, when, um, when, when putting pesticides into the field, the idea of the foliar activity, the expanding of the pores, actually suck in pesticides so that plants you want to get rid of, you can get rid of with a lot less poison released into the environment. The last thing I want to cover is really getting a little bit away from um, uh, the ways in which energy can be introduced to the body as we talked about electroacupuncture, um, the idea of moderating physical health, and there's lots of things that can be done. This is a, um, a product that was developed uh, by my friends again in, in Germany, and it's, a, and it's a compound that actually changes the energy state of the body. And let me talk a little bit about that. This is First Elements, and it'll be uh, released uh, late in 2005 in the United States. Um, but the idea behind this product was to look at a way to get energy into the body, um, perhaps chemically. And so here's what we created uh, in Germany. Uh, Robert Tiedemann spent almost four years uh, looking at um, uh, developing a way to get negative um, hydrogen into the body. In other words, a negative, basically negative um, energy uh, electrons, and you can measure um, electrons uh, by putting this this in solution. You can actually take a measurement that will show approximately uh, 700 negative electron volts. What we're talking about there, in in terms of um, energy, is releasing free electrons in the body. And what happens with that is 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 very simple. Uh, toxins within the body tend to be positively charged, so negatively charged particles lock on to those and neutralize them or take neutral particles, donate a free electron which makes them scavengers and they act as scavengers within uh, the body uh, taking, taking those toxins into a position where they can be eliminated uh, through the normal uh, methods that the body eliminates toxic, uh, toxic waste. The other thing that happens is when you're detoxifying, in most cases if you go uh, through regimes that detoxify the body you get really sluggish, you might even feel a little bit ill and, and weak for that first few days. With this material, that does not occur because it actually adds energy into the system that not only detoxifies you, but leaves you a net 
um, level of energy that actually increases your sense of, of um, alertness and focus um, without the edge of, say, caffeine, but the same alertness and focus. The other thing that happens is with this, if you take a, a, a half a gram a day, 500 milligrams a day in the morning and 500 milligrams a day in the afternoon, and you measure your pH, your acidic alkaline balance. In most of our diets in the West, we take in way too much acidic food. And you see it in hair loss, you see it in complexions, you see it in, in stomach disorders, um, and in, in generally bad health. Highly acidic systems um, are not the best for human beings. You want to be slightly on the alkaline side. When I started taking this product within five days and taking a um, a pH strip, which you can get at any drugstore or any um, pharmaceutical supply house. You can take and measure your pH level and look at it on a strip. So you can do it with saliva in the mouth or urine or blood, and you can look at your pH balance and see. And mine started out highly acidic at the beginning of this five-day period. I made no appreciable change in diet. Each day, in the morning and in the afternoon, took a pH test. And by the end of five days, my overall system was slightly on the alkaline side, my energetic state was much better, the acid feelings in my stomach were gone, and it was very, very quick. Uh, the, the idea behind adding energy in is the root behind this science, and it's something that we think as a nutritional supplement will offer great advantages uh, for folks um, in increasing their general energy state and sense of well-being. The idea behind diet as it connects to our health is extremely important. And we all know uh, the, the things that we're told about what to eat and what not to eat, but oftentimes we don't balance our system. So it's the idea of supplements in a busy and hectic world that offers other alternatives to getting those nutrients into the body and increasing the energy state of the body so that we can do better, perform better, um, and function in the 21st century. What we've covered today are a lot of areas, and we've touched on a lot of areas, and I draw your attention back to our earlier publications, back to our website for more information. Um, the reference to material is substantial. We're going to include some of that on the DVD, but for the sake of space and time, not everything can always be included. Get interested in these issues because they do matter. It's your health, it's our futures, and more importantly, it's a technology of the 21st century that don't drive us it's we that drive them. Let's make sure those technologies are used in our interest and not against us. Let's look for the future that makes us healthier, smarter, and more capable in a complex world. For more information on the products and things that we've discussed today, you can contact Earth Pulse Press. Our address is on the screen. Our website is on the screen. And we would appreciate hearing from you. We can also send you a catalog free of charge anywhere in the world and keep you informed on our issues. Go to earthpulse.com and sign up for our flash list. That will keep you on top of the latest information as we collect that information and make it available to the public.